Thank you very much. Uh, so I realize I have the dubious privilege of standing between the rest of the day and cocktails for many of us. And so I was going to try to serve cocktails during this, and it just didn't work out. I'm really fishing for good reviews here if you catch a theme. What we're really, really going to talk about, we are going to talk about online reviews, what it means to your business, what it means for your business. And this actually matters to you in any business category you happen to be in, whether you're a B2B brand or Starbucks, online reviews are a big deal for your business. And what it really starts with is your customer experience. So underpinning all of that, we've heard a lot about innovation and kind of uh, and that theme, but underpinning all of this is what customers feel about you when they've finished their transaction or they're in the middle of their transaction, how, you, how that manifests primarily online. And that's, that happens on, what, Yelp, on TripAdvisor, on Trust Radius, everywhere, everywhere online. And this only really matters, it's not an academic topic, it actually really matters to your business. It only really matters to your business because that's where your customers happen to be finding you. 92% of people look at online reviews when they're making a purchase decision. So, I mean, that's basically everyone except our grandmothers and our children who don't yet have phones. That's pretty much everyone at this point, 92%. And, there, and this, this crosses across all categories of business. It's not just B2C, which is its obvious application, but it goes much, much further than that. Now, that's problematic for us as marketing people because it's a little bit harder for us to influence the conversation there, naturally. But it's also a place where people feel that they can trust what they read, which I find just totally appalling as a marketing person. But uh, research shows People look at Yelp and TripAdvisor and these sites and say, hey, I actually trust those people writing those reviews more than my aunt or my friends or my mother. That's probably the best source of information for me to make a purchase decision. And well, I mean, what happened to us that we're, but we did that? What, why did we evolve to trust total strangers on the internet of all places more than our mothers or our aunts? I'm, it's rather appalling. So I just wanted to kind of Take a step back and look at the actual playing field out there. This is kind of fun to poke fun at businesses. So I've got some, some reviews here. I'm just going to read through some of these. This is a pizza place in Boston. If you ever make it to Boston, don't go to this one. Uh, it's in Cambridge, actually. Uh, it's a one-star one review. And what it says is this. You know when you are drunk and everything tastes good. Well, you know something sucks when you are drunk and it still tastes horrible. That's his one star, her one star review of this pizza place. It probably only helps the cause here that they've chosen Cartman from South Park as their mascot. If you are a South Park fan, if you watch it, if you have not seen the Yelper episode, it's, it is worth ripping off of the internet and saving onto your computer. It's primetime TV. So that's sort of a slap. Then you get, in the course of one day, you might get a beautiful kiss from a customer like this. This is a hotel in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, I've actually stayed there, although this is not my review. Uh, Five-star uh, review, great place to stay. And what I love about this, I mean, it's great to get a five-star review. As a marketing person, you're like, hallelujah, a five-star review. But they actually took time to reply to it. And it's actually a pretty specific reply when you read it says, Dear Troy W., thank you for staying with us this past weekend. Very specific, this past weekend. And also for taking the time to share your feedback, blah, blah, blah. The nice thing about this is this customer said nothing in there that was in any way critical or a recommendation or this could be better. It was just a nice review and they still took time to say thank you for writing us a nice review. We really appreciate it. And clearly they know who this customer was. It's the benefit of having a a local person, someone in the hotel respond to reviews, in this case versus someone at corporate, they know that Troy stayed here this weekend versus the corporate folks who just kind of use copy and paste. Uh, back to the slaps, uh, this is actually a client of mine in Los Angeles. <laughs> they, they clearly need some work. It's a, and it's an apartment 
that's an apartment community. They do you know, those sort of apartment communities with pools and stuff in them. And it, it happens. I mean, people get kicked out. They stop paying their rent. They're, they're, it foments anger just by the very nature of it being there. People get angry at it. Uh, this particular person is especially angry. And we're, we're working on ways for them to harvest reviews out of their members. I mean, they've got plenty of people who love living in their communities, but you don't really write and review of the place you live. It's kind of odd. It's an odd thing to review. So what is the right cadence to do that? That is a problem to solve because people are looking at this stuff when they're making a, a rental decision. They're, they're actually using Yelp. Uh, if you think B2B is immune from this thing, unfortunately you're wrong. I mean, there's, this is one example, G2 Crowd, uh, Trust Radius is another. There are tons of B2B uh, review sites. Uh, two, those are two of the biggest ones. And you know, certainly impacts the purchase decision. Uh, if you follow sort of content marketing trends, you know already that before someone picks up the phone to call you, the trend has been they've already made like two thirds or more of their purchase decision. So they're, if they're not looking at this stuff, they're stupid. I mean, this is, this is research that's sitting at their fingertips. And if you're making a thousand, thousand dollar deal or you know, multi thousand dollar deal, you better care enough to make a little bit of research. Uh, and lastly, you know, the healthcare industry is being really reshaped by reviews. It's a particularly difficult industry, uh, especially in the US, if there's tons and tons of regulatory stuff. You don't, you don't see doctors just hopping on and saying, hey, sorry about misdiagnosing that, that mole. Uh, I'll try harder next time. There, there are certain realities of the healthcare industry that make that not that ideal. But it's, it's still reshaping the industry. This doctor, he's actually here in Toronto, uh, Dr. Dimitrios Motakis. And a couple of things I want to point out about Dr. Motakis. First of all, he got the memo on personal branding. And that profile picture is pretty stellar. He is a cosmetic surgeon. I would, I would have high standards <laughs> for a cosmetic surgeon. But the, the thing is, if my doctor looked, at, looked like this, just like this, review says, I would look forward to going to see him too. I mean, it would just make me feel good by being in his office. You know, the, this, but he, he's doing something right here. He's doing something right. 58 reviews. So at some point in the transaction, he has to be saying to his, to his patients or his clients, I, I love you and I would love more patients like you. Would you review me? Maybe he's not saying it. Maybe his office staff are saying it. Someone's asking because you don't inherently go review your doctor. Has anyone in this room reviewed their doctor? Two people at this table. I, I've got to ask you questions later. Were you asked to review? Did, did someone say it? No. No. Neither case. Wow. This table is, if you're in the healthcare industry, go see them. They're good influencers. So, I mean, what, what sort of happened to us as a society? We like to beat up on each other so much. And we see it as a combat sport. There are, so, there's certainly, a, I think a deeper sociological trend weaving through our society, but it, it, we're not here really to talk about that. We're here to talk about what it means for your business, and it actually means a lot to your business. Uh, the idea for the book that I wrote on this uh, on this topic started as a just a conversation, a cocktail conversation with a friend of mine in Los Angeles. He at the time happened to have a hair salon, which is one of the top most rated things in the world. Hair salons, hair salons cafes, that kind of stuff. And you know, he just, he went, he ran through the full gamut of what any business owner, especially a small business experiences. It's the, the hateful customer who's posting on Yelp, uh, you know, frustrations with the Yelp sales staff, in, in his case being really pushy, trying to take money out of his pocket. He didn't know how to grow reviews on the platform. And, and what he sort of came to is this realization that, you know, these, these platforms like Yelp and TripAdvisor, G2 Crowd, if you're in B2B, they sort of have inserted themselves as an intermediary between me and my customer. These are still my clients, and yet I now have to pay the piper, uh, or pay the, the henchmen, like mutiny, or it's not mutiny, what, what would be the right word to use there? I've got to pay them basically my lunch money, or they make it very difficult. I think we've all felt like this. Do you, do you guys know who this lovely lady is? Monica Lewinsky. She, in the US, I mean, she's etched into our political memory in the US. It was, she was the famous one who may or may not have had certain relationship with 
President Clinton. Uh, and I'm not really going to talk about that. The, the thing about, about her, she, she last year did a TED Talk just talking about her experience as a person, as a, as a private individual, kind of being exposed in public for the first time. And I want to read one of the quotes uh, from her talk because it's really when I heard, saw her say it, when I saw it, I thought, wow, that kind of strikes a chord with me. Uh, she said that overnight, I went from being a completely private figure to a publicly humiliated one worldwide. I was, a, I was patient zero of losing a personal reputation on a global scale almost instantaneously. This rush to judgment enabled by technology led to mobs of virtual stone throwers. So she goes through that, that story, the fact that she, was, she went from no one knowing who she was to everyone hating her and shaming her publicly online for the rest of her life. And a lot of businesses, brand folks, even marketing folks feel that way too. It's the exact same dynamic, whether it's an individual like Monica Lewinsky or a large brand that we choose to shame over some decision they made. It's the same thing as cyberbullying. It just manifests in different contexts, whether for a, a brand that, than it would maybe for someone like Monica Lewinsky. The thing is, we have to view this as the battlefield for our customers because that's, in truth, we are in marketing, right? We are in the business of finding more customers. Is there any business in this room or in the world that says, we have all the customers we ever need? I'm not, I'm not, I don't need to market to them at all. I just need to sell and upsell and do retention. I don't need to find new customers. I mean, that's preposterous. So, of course, we're in the hunt for new customers all the time. And they're found on, in many cases, on these platforms. Or they're finding us as brands and businesses on these platforms. So it is sort of the battlefield that we're dealt, left to dealt, deal with. The, the obvious risk is if things don't go well for you on that platform, 87% of the time, a consumer will say, nope, not going to do business with those folks. They don't seem trustworthy. Businesses with low ratings clearly lose out in the purchase, the purchase decision. Sort of the, the somewhat good news in that same study, 82% of consumers, they, they take a sort of meta-analysis of reviews. They, they're reading a couple, between two and 10, so at least a couple of reviews, anywhere between two and 10. They're looking at what are kind of a, a scroll up of people's experience at that, at that place, that business. So they're not just going to look at that one bad review and say, because of that, I'm not going there. They will at least get, spend some time to investigate. But the thing is, you know, 87% of them, if, it's, if it, their meta-analysis at the end is like, mm, not so sure, seems a little dodgy, you may be at risk uh, of losing them. And what I, what I figured out in, in doing all of the research, talking to businesses, there is sort of an underlying framework to the online review industry that is exploited by the platforms that have the reviews. It's exploited by, in many cases, the people that take advantage of it, make money off of it. So why don't we exploit it too? It's the playbook that if we don't choose to play by, it's, it's the playbook. That's how things are done. And it kind of starts with this. This is now the second presentation that has had an image of a store in it. There was the gentleman earlier talking about uh, uh, search terms. If you walk into a grocery store, what is the first part of the grocery store you typically see? The produce department, right? And unless you're like me and you go in the exit door frequently, you go to the produce department and in part, they put a lot of money in the produce department. I used to work in a grocery store in the produce department, and we, we made a lot of effort to make it look beautiful because it's the first thing people see. You want the store to feel fresh and, and vibrant. And if you walk into a store like that, are you likely to continue shopping? Unless you absolutely need zero produce, probably not likely, versus a thing like this. This is a, obviously a farmer's market. It looks bountiful and beautiful, of course. I, mean, I don't even know what all of those things are, but I want them all, and I want to cook them and eat them. They just look beautiful. The thing about it is on the, the internet, Google and Bing, but really Google is kind of 
the only thing, right? Google cares about freshness too. They look at stuff on a web page, content on a web page, and they use that as a signal in search. So yes, they're looking at incoming links, they're looking at you know, search terms and all of the other SEO things they look at. They also look at how frequently that page has been updated because what happened in about 2006, there were a bunch of scammers who were doing, uh, it's known as black hat SEO. They've worked in the SEO uh, search business. You may be familiar with some of their tactics like stuffing links onto a page to trick Google into thinking another page was highly relevant. And what they found was those pages aren't updated very often and the pages that are updated somewhat often are generally a better choice to serve up to consumers for that particular query. So freshness became a thing. Well, along at the same time came marching Yelp and TripAdvisor and these other review platforms. And whether that was by design or just by, just by happenstance, Yelp is, is filled with fresh content every day. Millions and millions and millions of reviews come into their system every day. How frequently is a Yelp profile for a Starbucks location updated? Once per minute, once per 10 minutes, a lot. And therefore, Google loves Yelp. They know that whether it's always the right answer or not, it's at least a good source of fresh content. And it's the same, it's the same is true for healthcare industry, the same is true for Trust Radius, G2 Crowd, any site that has reviews benefits from this concept of freshness. And this started way back in 1994. This is always a question, I think I've only ever had one person answer this question correctly. In 1994, Yahoo launched. Does anyone know what the word Yahoo stands for? The actual word. You kind of, it seemed like you sort of, you've read it once, or, yeah. It stands for something. Uh, it stands for yet another hierarchical ordinal oracle, or something like that, which is basically a fancy phrase that means a card catalog to the internet. It was humans who, it's like Wikipedia, they sat down and said, this is a site about Toyota and Toyota Camry and Toyota Camry SE in 1998 edition. They, they edited that, that collection of stuff on the internet into those, those categories. Of course, it's very easy to trick, it's not very easy to trick a human it doesn't scale very well when you have billions of pages, you can't really, I mean, if every human being on the planet said, I'll do one, you know, you're still kind of coming up short. So along came Google and, and the whole industry developed out of that disruption. So here's the thing, consumers have adapted to this concept of freshness too. Recent study found 69% of consumers don't even look at reviews older than three months. So if a business says, you know, I've got 12 awesome reviews on my whatever, and uh, I, I don't have that many customers coming in, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty good. Like I can just, I can rest on the, my laurels of my 12 good reviews and four and a half stars. You're not pretty good. I mean, if they're older than three months, if it's a 2012, 2012 was the most recent review you have had, a consumer may look at that and say, What's going on? Are they still in business? Are they around? Like, who, who are these people? 2012. Has their menu changed since 2012? Uh, we've, we've adapted to freshness, in part because there's, there, there isn't really a choice. I mean, you go to Yelp, you're just looking at the first reviews on there, right? And that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, so that's sort of the love triangle. Google, Bing, and other search sites, mostly Google, and sites like Yelp, all kind of exist in this love triangle with freshness. And it's a really, really important concept to think about in your marketing efforts, not only from this perspective of online reputation and, and, and reviews and, and so forth, but also for your site. You know, if you're trying to improve your standing on Google, it's a bit of a sidebar to this whole discussion, but if you want to be relevant to Google and you are in any way kind of in, in the retail business, e-commerce business, and don't have reviews, on your website, you may be already at a disadvantage. In fact, Google is so important, even to Yelp. Uh, I was shocked when I heard, when I read this. Yelp, despite its largesse, it's huge. I mean, it's, I don't know how huge it is in Canada. In the US, it's massive, particularly in the coast. Not, not as much in the middle of the country, but on the coasts. 75% of Yelp's monthly site traffic comes from Google. They're still getting 
all that traffic from Google. So if, if we think that Google sort of is, a sidebar doesn't matter, and search is sort of a secondary tier thing, it, uh, this convinced me at least that search matters now probably more than ever uh, for any business. So you know, the equation there, the freshness thing, the thing that, get, that frustrates businesses the most, brands the most, is Yelp and TripAdvisor, all of it is built on top of your business without you they wouldn't be in business. They wouldn't have local listings. They wouldn't have data. They wouldn't have reviews. They wouldn't have users. So everything on there is about the business and the brand, and yet they do very, very little to improve their relationship with those businesses and brands. Some of the sites are better than others, but most of them do very little kind of development of this work with businesses. So, you know, from my perspective, when I was looking at this, I kind of thought, where you know, all of these, these businesses I'm talking to are right. Where is the love for your business? Because they should care more, perhaps, about you than even they might care about their, their consumer, uh, or at least should care as much about you as they care about their consumer. So that, that's sort of where the genesis of the word manipulated came from, uh, which is just a big made-up word. I, uh, another sidebar I'll tell you, uh, this was a little bit of a search play for me, too. If you had Googled the word manipulated before I wrote the book, there was nothing. And now if you Google it, it's all about the book. So it's a good strategy. I'll just share that. So I want to kind of share a little bit with you some specific ways businesses are harmed and kind of where I think things went a little bit sideways. The first one is there's just an inherent conflict of interest between what these sites sort of face. The, the fact that they exist is already a conflict of interest because they've got I mean, they've got the people who use it on their site. That's pretty obvious. They also have you guys and, the, and other businesses on there. But they, the, the quirky thing that mo most of them also have is their shareholders. And that is where it gets a little bit tricky because now they have to find a way to not just make a little money, but lots of money, in many cases, very quickly. So things, I think, have developed a little bit because of that. These aren't nonprofit organizations. They're, they're out to serve themselves and their shareholders. So you know, that we sort of were promised that reviews are going to democratize the internet just like the internet democratized a lot of other stuff and we're all going to make more money and become richer because of it and I think a lot of business owners, a lot of brands don't really feel that way. They feel almost punished for being in business by, by what happens on these sites. And that there, are three, there were three things I identified. One was fake reviews, which is a very prevalent problem. We'll talk about very quickly. Uh, profiteering by the sites themselves and some overall things I saw in the reputation management industry too I want to talk about. So the first is fake reviews. The, the sad fact of it is when Yelp went, went public, when it filed to go public, they, they disclosed and, and said, you know, we get a lot of reviews every day. 25% uh, of those reviews are actually fake. That's a threat to our business. I think that's a fair assessment. You know, a quarter of the stuff that you get is fake. Now, they, they don't actually show that content on the site. So maybe, you know, from their perspective, they say, we screen out the fake content. The truth is, there was another study, I think from MIT, a team there that found another 30% of reviews on Yelp were fake. So now you're at 25% they didn't show. Of the remaining 75%, 30% of those are fake. I, I mean, I don't know what that math is. At, at, at that point, it's like, what do you trust on, on these sites? And the truth behind the fake reviews, the reason they're there, it doesn't really take much to write a review. You, if you need an email address, that's pretty easy to come by nowadays. And that's pretty much all you need to do it. I talked to a young lady who does this for a living. She actually writes and sells fake reviews on Fiverr. And that's, that's her whole job. That's her whole living. That's her life's work. It's like, man, you've got a long life ahead of you. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how you're going to feel about this in 20 years. But her thing is, she's not a terrible person. She's not. She's trying to make a buck and make a living and, you know, feed her herself. But the, the thing about it, she's become super smart at some really technical stuff, like masking her IP address to trick Amazon and Yelp into thinking she's all over the place. So she's in New Orleans and Seattle and Raleigh and Toronto. She knows how to do that and that 
keeps her in good standing on those sites. She also is very good at using multiple accounts, each one with its own sort of persona. She's got like the military mother and the college student and the retiree. She's built these little characters for herself. So all of her military mother reviews live on the military mother review profile. She's really good at that. And she uh, got into the business of tricking Amazon. If you, buy, you, if you use Amazon a lot, you know when you buy something, you review it, it gets marked as a verified purchase. So she does that. She'll have the company pay her to buy the product. Then when she writes their, their fake review, it gets marked as a verified purchase. And they kind of verify, uh, therefore, going around their, their attempt at introducing some authenticity to the reviews on Amazon. So these are the things that she's doing to trick it. And she actually is just one of an army of people. Last year in the fall, Amazon sued 1,200 people that it accused of writing fake reviews for hire on its platform. She was one of them, so she's not in this business anymore. But they, they, don't, I mean, they don't know who these people are. They're anonymous behind an email address. They're never going to find them. That's just really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, one of the things that she said, it just it sticks with me. Every time I read this, I still get stuck on it. And I, I'm not big on parsing people's words, trying to, to do that. But uh, you kind of can't help to do it in this case. My one good review isn't going to make or break a business or a customer. As much as I embellish and write about businesses and products I haven't used, I try not to blatantly lie about what the product or business is capable of doing. And I, I didn't ask her at the time because I'm not really a jerk, but I should have been. I should have said, you know, how do you not, how do you, how do you resolve that nagging feeling that you're not blatantly lying with the fact you've never used the product. That seems like the two things don't really go together. But at any rate, that's her worldview. She sees this as helping businesses just get a leg up on society and get started, you know. And that's maybe, maybe that's a good thing she's doing. I don't know. It's, it's more of an existential question. The thing is, fake reviews don't really help anyone. There's a zero-sum game. They don't help Amazon or any of those sites. They don't help us make better decisions as consumers. Uh, they may even, help, as marketing people, if we're looking at that feedback, they may hurt us by giving us some false signals about what people find useful or don't find useful about a product. Uh, and they, they really harm the whole system. So fake reviews are really a very real problem. Has anyone in this room dealt with fake reviews before? Actually, legitimate fake reviews? One. You care to share? Crowd reviews. Yeah. yeah. Um, I found that there is a profile that I created a long time ago on that site. And uh, since then, there's been a ton, a ton load of uh, reviews about the company I work for. But I found that they're all fake. Yeah. And if I search for uh, that person's name on that site, they also have multiple reviews on our competitors. Uh, yeah. Profiles too. So, that's, you know, that's so they're equal opportunists on the takedown. <laughs> I, I mean, I have so many stories that are some very salacious about fake reviews. Yeah. I find that it's uh, the way that I spot up fake reviews, whenever I see like real weird tales, mm -hmm. where it's like you have a lot of five-star reviews, yeah. but then you have also a lot of one-star reviews, and that's usually, that doesn't make sense. So that's when, and then you start reading through it and you start seeing the patterns in those five-star reviews. Yeah and you start seeing the legitimacy of the one-star reviews. Yeah. I've seen that several times on Amazon. I mean, how frequent is a business either so terrible or so amazing and never in between? I mean, that's a very unusual business. I don't know a business like that. I don't know any, any business like that. Either it's hated or it's loved and no, no real in between. Uh, so that is a good, that's a good signal to spot, you know, as a consumer, it's a really good signal to use. So, Fake reviews are a big problem. The second problem I identified, and this, is, this really pinches small business owners the most, although medium and large businesses get uh, pinched by it to some degree as well. It's this feeling of, of someone taking my lunch money. It's the godfather who comes in and says, here, look, I'm, here's what's gonna happen. I am gonna have a party. I'm gonna have a big town hall meeting, invite a bunch of people, and it's gonna be actually, it's gonna be about your business. I'm gonna, the whole thing is gonna be about your business. Everything, we're gonna talk about you. 
And you're welcome to come into the room. You can stand in the back of the corner if you'd like. Uh, you can't talk to anybody, though. Just stand back there and have a listen. If you would like to talk, then there's going to be some sponsorship money that's needed to be put on the table. How's that feel? Are, is that all right? Does that feel okay? I can't, I can't promise you what's going to be said there. You might want to pay for an opportunity to, to speak your piece. And, you know, in, in, I believe in, in Italy this is known as omerta, which is kind of a code of silence around the mafia, but it's, it's this feeling that someone's taking money out of your pocket, your lunch money. And in, the, in sales, we would call that, or the sales industry would call that fear-based selling. If you don't do this thing that I'm telling you you should do, I cannot guarantee the outcome tomorrow. It may, it may not go so great for you. It's fear-based selling, and of course it doesn't really work, but it, if you are targeting someone who feels vulnerable, small business in particular, which is why they get pinched by this, uh, of course they're gonna feel some urgency to act. If they feel like, I, I actually don't know if this is gonna go well for me, I might just wanna put that couple hundred bucks a month on my credit card and see where it goes. Uh, and it goes back to that whole thing about the conflict of interest. Why am I paying Yelp for something that I should be able to do myself anyway? Uh, these are my customers, not theirs, but the way, that's not the way the industry is structured. So the fear-based selling, the profiteering thing is a very real problem for businesses. What it causes a lot of them to do is have an absolute anger against rating and review platforms. Yelp in particular, but all of them kind of suffer from this. They have an anger against them and say, I don't really want to play, play ball with them because they're so evil. And when something bad happens on that platform, they're not paying attention. Or they, if they are, they have a knee-jerk reaction and say, screw it. I'm skipping it and moving on. So that's really the, the problem with that. The third one then is reputation management, the reputation management industry, which I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush stroke here because I sort of work in this business myself. But blackmail is a very real problem. Uh, this is, and I say it very plainly because it's actually blackmail. It's not just uh, a phrase I'm tossing in for a sensational moment. Uh, this happened to a group of friends of mine in San Francisco. They, they are photographers, sort of wedding and baby photographers. And if you think about their business, actually, they might have a total of how many clients in one week? Maybe five, six. If they're in weddings, they might have four. If they're lucky. The opportunity for them to capture reviews, pretty limited. I mean, they might have four or five opportunities every week in the first place. So low volume business. Uh, and sort of the way it happened was someone emailed them and said, I want to hire you, and then said, you know, no, it, never mind, I don't really want to hire you anymore, but uh, I'm, I'm in the reputation management industry, by the way, and should you ever get, I heard there's this thing going around with photographers and uh, they're being threatened with fake reviews, if that ever happens, you can call me or e email me and I can, I can make it go away, I can help you fix it. If you've worked in the search industry or reputation industry for, for a minute, you know you don't just make things go away. You can't delete something off of Yelp unless you wrote it. So therefore, when that same person came back uh, later under a different email address and said, you, you're at my friend's wedding and you, you uh, made someone trip over you and I'm gonna sue you and I'm gonna have all of my friends write nasty reviews about you unless you do this thing for me. Uh, the, the initial thing that a photographer might think is panic. They might feel like, oh God, you know, one bad review could really, really damage my star rating on a platform. I'm kind of worried about this. And it turns out it was a blackmail scheme and they started talking to each other about it and figured it out. Fortunately, none of them ended up paying for it, uh, but they all got, a lot of them got threatened by it. Uh, reputation management businesses can also just be severely overpriced. If you've worked with some of them, you might know that already. You know, the things that they actually can do are pretty straightforward. I mean, it's a little elbow grease mean, would get you to the same out, outcome if you have time and a little bit of uh, resources at your fingertips. Uh, and in some cases, they actually give bad advice. It may be borderline black hat SEO kind of stuff that they will be doing or possibly buying fake reviews I've seen some evidence of that. So you want to be very careful when you're hiring reputation management business or uh, uh, consultants or business. They are not always the easy answer, the, the easy path out. So uh, five quick things that I identified successful businesses doing with reviews that I think everybody can learn from. These are easy, simple things. First one is know how to prioritize what sites matter to your business. And this, 
this, the obvious way here is just to ask. Say, you know, where did you find me? You can do surveys. You can look at your analytics to see where your inbound traffic is coming from. When people come to your site, are they coming from Yelp or TripAdvisor or TrustRadius or some other place? That would give me a pretty good signal that that is the thing for you to focus on. That's, that's the first. The second is treat every single review that you get as a marketing opportunity. It really is a marketing opportunity. It's a story. It's a story between you and that customer. And whether it was an amazing review and someone says, this is the best gobbledygook place I have ever been, you just say, thank you. I love you. I'll see you next time. Uh, and if they have something critical to say, you apologize and you know, put your best effort into a, a, a well-crafted review a uh, response. The thing about that is it's a story. It becomes part of your record. Whether the actual customer then comes back to you or that gets resolved kind of doesn't really matter. The point is other customers will see that interaction and feel like you are a pretty fair place to do business with and are smart enough to pay attention to the place where their peers are. Uh, so make every review count. The third one, keep them fresh. So you want to be in the business then of asking for reviews. You want to be in the business of finding the right place, right time, right opportunity to say, I love working with you, and I would, I would really prefer more customers like you. Would you do me the, the benefit of a, re a review? That's the best thing you can do for my business. My dentist does this, although he happens to be a friend of mine too. He is very good about, he's very good, first of all, he's a great dentist, but he's good about that, that sort of, I really enjoy you. The best referral you can give me is a review, and I prefer it on Yelp. That's where people find me. Uh, that's his method. You, you can find other ways to do it, of course, Marketing automation can help in this case too. If you're in a high volume business, you can do it uh, via email. It's, that's a great way to reinforce it. Uh, the fourth one is show off great reviews. When you get something that's amazing, don't be shy about putting it in an email newsletter or uh, focus, uh, inserting it into your Facebook content calendar, something like that. Uh, in many cases, you can embed the actual review. You can't quote it uh, or, or copy and paste it without the approval of the person who wrote it, but you can a lot of ways you can kind of show off that great review. People like to know that they're in good company. If you, if you have a place you love, you like to know that other people love it too. And that's just a good feeling that, you know, I like that business, other people love it. I'm gonna make an appointment and go back to see Dr. Motakis tomorrow. Uh, and then the fifth is you, uh, you have to know when and how to seek help. Not always through these other methods are you gonna fix a problem that's happened. So is it a reputation management company that you need? Maybe. Is it a lawyer? Probably not, but maybe. And, and what do you say to them when you talk to them? So you kind of have to know when and why and how to seek help. So those are the five things to do. Um, just kind of wrap up here. Uh, code of conduct, I found almost universally businesses that are doing great things for their business with reviews kind of follow this mantra for themselves. This is more for the small business owner who might have a tendency to a knee-jerk reaction. They may be doing everything themselves, but it's true of all businesses too. I mean, this is, this is, goes back to that importance of the focus on customer experience. People want to do business with, with places and increasingly, uh, I saw some research that most marketers believe by the end of this year, by the end of 2016, they will be competing on customer experience more than anything else which is pretty shocking, not, by, not on price, not even necessarily on product features, on customer experience. People like to do business with uh, places they like. So practice good review hygiene every day. Take it very seriously. Don't treat it with that flip kind of, you know, only if I really have to am I gonna do this uh, kind of attitude. Don't take things personally. In many, most cases, in almost every case, it's not a personal attack on you. It's maybe the person was having a bad day and they just happened to lash out at you because you were the nearest thing to them, that happens. And follow the steps I outlined. Don't, you know, don't cut corners by hiring fake reviews or seeking out someone to kind of stuff your reviews with uh, other things. So that's sort of the code of, code of conduct that is a good place to start. Any questions about anything in here or anything, the online re reputation, online review industry? Yes.
Yeah, that's, that's the first question of especially larger brands. Like, why would we do this? We, we're doing just fine without them. Do we really need to do this? And the, I, I, I mean, certainly you can find data points that would be industry specific that say 72% of customers are already down the purchase path by the time they call our sales rep. So that's not a good situation for us. If as part of their awareness funnel or their consideration funnel, they're looking at reviews, they may have disconsidered us at that point. So we didn't even cross that threshold. Uh, you know, the truth is, yes, of course you're going to get bad reviews. If you start asking every person to review you, some of them are be like, that software is total crap. I mean, honestly, that software is total crap. But most people are pretty fair for the most part. And what you're really relying on by not, not actively going after reviews, you're relying on someone so amazed that they can't help but want to review you or so angry that they can't help but want to review you. And that's not really a gamble I would want to take with any of business of mine. You know, you want to kind of activate that, that happy middle, somewhere between the one and the five, that sort of two to three, two to four. I would rather have a, a 3.5 you know, star rating on a review profile than a five star, two reviews. I would rather have a 3.5, 450 review profile. Because the truth is, that's much easier, much harder to game at that point. If someone wants to take me down, a competitor wants to you know, put fake reviews on my profile, they're going to have to try a lot harder. Uh, and that's, that's one, one way to answer it. Other questions? Yes, back here. I, if I had unlimited money and time, I would study that. Because I think it's an interesting downward spiral in our social structure. The fact that we, we, we I mean, I, you all seem like nice people, and I would certainly listen to anything you have to say about restaurants or doctors or anything. But I would still trust my mother first, personally. Uh, but I, so I, whether there is something weird about what we consider trust, you know, people, like, I have... 12,000 friends on LinkedIn or whatever. Those aren't real friends. Uh, maybe there's like trust, and then there's real trust up here. But all of the research I've seen, I mean, every trust barometer I have seen kind of reinforces the, the point that peer generated, consumer generated content is considered the most trustworthy. Uh, and maybe it's because just the volume is there. People assume, like Wikipedia, it's mostly true. That's, that's, kind of my assumption, there's this, you know, it's good enough, and it should be, for the most part, mostly true. Uh, people also trust Wikipedia, so I don't know what that says. I don't know if that answers the question, but. No, it doesn't, but it's a big question. Yeah, uh, it is a big question. Yeah, and I think even you partially answered it in that, in terms of volume, maybe that's not so much trusting, uh, like trusting like you do a friend, but maybe that's trust in the sense of, of, uh, authority as a sales principle. You know, yeah. That's, that's trust. yeah. I think you know you trust the size of the crowd and its general sense of the, the their review of, of a particular place. You know, I that's an interest that would be an interesting thing to study. Would you do you trust a restaurant with a thousand reviews more than the one with ten? It might only have six tables. Uh, that that would be an interesting way to kind of parse that because I think it's that's an interesting point. I think it also has to do with review criteria. Like, uh, the reason why I might trust a stranger over my mom for, for example, a tech thing is because that person might know a lot more about that versus yep. my mom might not. So I think it has to do with that. And the same thing when I look at reviews, sometimes I'll ignore bad reviews if 
they are clear on the criteria that they're judging it on. Yeah. Um, and I trust reviews when they talk about the criteria that they're judging it on a lot more. Yeah. So if they say, I like this Mac because of blah, 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 then I trust that review more because they know how they're making that decision and they're making their thought process transparent. Yeah. Uh, so I think that has something to do with it. I do too. I think there's a good case to be made if you're in the e-commerce business in particular for structured review content on your own website. So if you're in the, the MacBook business or you know you sell MacBooks, for example, uh, there are there's software you can you can get from Grade Us or a lot of others that allow you to structure it's not just give us a star rating and review the product. It's give us a star rating, review the, sh the shopping experience, review the shipping experience, review the product features. Do you like the this? Do you like the that? So it gives some structured data to the review that the health, uh, the rate MD site does that really well. A lot of the healthcare sites do it well. Rate the wait time, rate the, the how long were you with the doctor? How long did you wait to see the doctor? Uh, they structure it so it's great, I mean, it's great data to have. Structured data is always better than just that, uh, right? Uh, that, I think, is an important, an important point. So G2 Crowd, that, the B2B software example I showed, it's very structured. So the, the things they ask you to, to say about the software is reasonably well structured. That would, that would help me trust it a little bit more than just read everything I have to say in my giant, big giant rant about this software, which isn't quite as helpful. Any other questions? All right, I have a question. What time are cocktails and where are they to be had? That's what's next. Yeah. <laughs> Can I please, thank you.